Amen. Well, this week I was at a mayor's meeting with other ministers, and uh, uh, there are a lot of things going on, as you know, in the news, things happening all over, and I'm going to show you a video in a second. The Lord had reminded me of a video that I saw in 2015, uh, a, a prophetess that had described the things that the Lord had shown her uh, of what's going on or what's coming in our country. And so there's many people wondering what's happened. Now, we know the devil's behind the scenes doing things, okay? And uh, in this meeting, uh, the police chief was there, other ministers were there, and uh, one of the things that the police chief said was, uh, with the situations going on in riots in Baton Rouge, out of 49 people that were arrested, 42 of them were from another state. One not from Louisiana, only seven was from here. And what I, what I told them was this, I said, are you aware that Islam is jumping on board and creating havoc, and who's behind this, a lot of Islamic uh, people are behind us. And he said, yeah, we're aware. So again, as your pastor, I want you to know what's going on so you can pray accurately, okay? Because uh, again, the devil's behind it. He's behind it, and we can make a difference through prayer. So right now, before we get started, as he's doing that, let's go ahead and pray for America right now. Just let's, let's lift up your voice with me right now. Father, we lift up this country, Lord God. And Father, we bind every demonic principality ruling spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places, Lord God, that would stir up hatred and prejudice and strife and murder and, Lord God, to try to thwart the plans of God. Father, we just dispatch angels in the name of Jesus to disperse all of this, Lord God. We plead the blood of Jesus over this great nation, Lord God. And Father, we pray Lord God, that these plots would all come to naught and be exposed, Lord God. Father, we ask it in the name of Jesus. We pray a hedge of protection, Lord God, over the innocent, Lord God. Father, over innocent policemen, Lord God, over innocent citizens, Lord God, that the hedge would be about them, Lord God, that no more innocent blood would be shed, Lord God. Father, we ask this, Lord God, in the name, above all names, the name of Jesus, and we say, amen, amen. So keep praying, church, keep praying. Now, I'm teaching on prayer. We taught on when you fast, when you give, and when you pray. So prayer is such an integral and important thing. Jesus said in Luke 18 and 1, he said this. Also, Jesus told them a parable in effect that they ought always to pray and not to turn coward, faint, lose heart, and give up. Prayer should, not, should be a priority and not our last resort. Like one person said, let's have a prayer meeting. Let's pray about it. And they said, has it come to this? No, you pray first. You go to God first. Every day that you don't pray and I don't pray, what we're saying is, God, I got this. God, I can handle this. God, I'll figure it out. But if we'll learn to rely upon the Lord, prayer becomes a lifestyle and a habit. When I, this has worked 100% of the time in my life. When I don't know how to fix something, I don't understand what to do, I say, God, grant me wisdom. James 1.5, I pray, and God gives me wisdom. So God is always there. It's not necessarily uh, just when you're on your knees in a, a time or a moment of prayer, but no, prayer is a lifestyle. Prayer is an attitude. I would pray while I'm driving. I'll pray while I'm in the shower. I'll pray while I'm working, whatever I'm doing. And God is there listening. So we can pray, literally, uh, all throughout the day at different times. One lady was a, a mighty intercessor. And what she did is when she would vacuum the carpet, she would pray. That was her time of prayer when she was doing housework. So whatever you got to do, whether doing the dishes, you can pray and petition God for your family, for the nation, for the church. Now, to pray effectively, we have to study the art of prayer. We have to learn how to pray. You know, I've seen people on the spot even to, to pray over to dinner, you know, or, or food. And they say, oh, you say grace today. And they go, oh, uh, oh Lord, uh, you know, just kind of awkward because you're not used to praying. Well, you need to learn how to pray. And as a pastor, I want to teach you how to pray and pray effectively. You know, we're going to look at all different types of prayer. Basketball has rules, football has rules, and baseball has rules. Baseball rules won't work in football, and football rules won't work in basketball. You need to understand how to pray effectively uh, so you can be uh, effective in your prayer life to get things done. Now, the disciples of Jesus noticed a correlation of prayer and works of power. Prayer and works of power. Jesus went from one place of prayer to another place of prayer. And then power was released every time he would pray. He would go pray, and then he would heal the sick and do great things. Now, Jesus is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh, as equal to the Father, as much as God as the Father and the Holy Spirit, but yet he was limited as a man. Now, if he had to pray, and he had no sin, he was perfect, don't you think you and I need to pray? If he prayed, 
We need to pray. He set the example, and the disciples saw this. So the disciples said to him in Luke 11 and 1, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. I see something with this. I see a difference. People will know when you've been in the presence of God. People will know when you've been praying. People will know when you've spent time with him. And people will also know when you have it. Because you'll have a tude. You'll have an attitude. You'll have something. You think everything will get on your nerves. It'll be like you got hormones out of control if you're not in the presence of the Lord. But when you're in God's presence, people will recognize. I remember knocking on a lady's door, and it was a, a tenant in a place that we owned. And she, I knocked on the door, and I opened the door. She said, you're a Christian. I see Jesus in your eyes. That's what she told me. I didn't say a word. I didn't say a word to her. She said, I see Jesus in your eyes. People will know when you've spent time in his presence. Now, as believers, again, we are commanded to pray. Commanded to pray. Ephesians 6 and 18 in the Amplified says this. Pray at all times, on every occasion. And I put not just Christmas and Easter, because some people would go to church every Christmas and every Easter. That was me a long time ago, just maybe twice a year. But now, of course, I love to live in God's house. Or even when you're in trouble. But it says in every season... And every season, we go through seasons in our spirit, good times, hard times, whatever you're going through, the Bible says to pray. It says pray in the spirit. Well, well this is an this is a, a amazing thing because we're going to get to later talk about praying in tongues and praying in the spirit and praying the mysteries of God. But praying spirit-led prayers where the Holy Spirit comes upon you and leads you how to pray. I've been praying one time for something with finances. I, I'm saying, oh God, I'm praying about my, my, my bills or the whatever in the house. And all of a sudden, it came upon my heart. I'm praying for Israel and I'm praying for his people and I'm praying for people in India and all kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, wow, where did that come from? Came from the Holy Ghost. What's on his heart gets on your heart. I asked God one time, I, of course, I was driving in the car, and I said, God, I want your heart. Father, I want your heart. He said, son, you'll have my heart, but you're going to have my joy, and you're going to have my tears, too. What makes me cry is going to make you cry. What makes me laugh is going to make you laugh. Because when you enter into a place of prayer, you get God's heart. You'll get his heart. And you'll know how to pray for other people. You'll begin to love people. You'll see people through the love of God. You won't look and, and try to criticize people anymore. If you're, if you're offended with someone, the Bible says to pray for that person. Why? Because you can't remain offended with someone you pray for. You'll, you'll have God's love in your heart for them. You won't be critical of preachers and people. You will love people. I remember seeing uh, Benny Hinn in India and thousands of people coming to Christ. And my heart just went out to the people and just the love of God filling my heart. Because what's, what's important to him becomes important to you as you pray for other people. It's so important. It says, pray in the Spirit with all manner of prayer and entreaty. All manner of prayer. And that's what I'm going to teach you about. All manner of prayer and entreaty. To the end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose. This is important. You've got to stay in your purpose. Strong purpose. Understand the purpose of God for your life. And that's why we have to watch and pray because the enemy will try to knock you off a kilter of your purpose. Get you out of the house of God. Get you so busy about other things you can't be busy about heavenly things. Jesus is coming back. Don't get so busy about the things of this earth and the affairs of this life that we're not giving any time to prayer. Not giving any time to his word. Because listen, the day, the day will come when you and I will stand before the Lord and none of this stuff's going to matter anymore. None of the little aggravations of life. Your grass is not cut. Your house is not clean. That's why I couldn't go to church. I couldn't pray because the dishes were dirty. They're always going to be dirty. Just have a couple teenagers. I'll make sure they're always dirty. <laughs> Life's going to throw stuff at you. We have to make time. We have to make time. It's amazing if I call a baseball meeting. We're going to have baseball guys. Guys will all show up but if I call a prayer meeting everybody's got something to do. Got a prayer meeting. I remember once we we when, we, when someone gets married, we like to take out the young man, and the heavenly bachelor party is simply this. We take him somewhere, lay hands on him in the power of God, hits him in the Holy Ghost. Well, this fellow was gay, man, that's what we do. This guy was getting married. And uh, I remember it was Joey Hall and myself sitting in the car, and we're praying, and we went over to his house where all the young guys were meeting, and they were going to play Nintendo and video games. So Joey and I took hands we said in the name of Jesus we're believing for revival so we walked in there we said guys we're gonna pray and you can see their faces like oh really oh we're gonna pray yeah but see the Holy Ghost brings the dynamic of prayer we begin to lay hands and they start falling out bam 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 all over the floor and we were prophesying and the Lord God would say unto you and the fire hit that place the fire hit that place afterwards they're like we want to pray 
We want to pray. There's power in prayer. Oh my goodness. They saw another dynamic of prayer when the Holy Ghost showed up. Matter of fact, the pastor at the time, I wasn't pastor, heard about it. And he said, hey man, we're going to have a prayer meeting in our house. We want you guys to come. So we, we sure enough went to his house and he started laying hands on people that were falling over. And then we, I laid hands on a pastor with another person. He fell out. They had a God that had never been hit with the power of God. Now look, I'm a crazy believer. You understand right now, I'm out of my mind. Just understand that. I put on the mind of Christ, okay? A long time ago, my mind never did me any good anyway. So I'm dancing around the spirit like this. No, no kidding. I'm going, woo, and I play the music. And a guy is right in the middle. He has never been hit with the power of God. And I touched him. Fire! And he goes, oh, boom, he hits the ground. He's on the ground. And I'm dancing around. And I see him. Every time I try to get up, I go, fire! And he go, plunk. And I dance around some more. And he tried to get up, and I go, fire! And he go, plunk. This was going, I didn't know what I did. The power of God was hitting him. And I'm just dancing around, having a good old time. He said, that never happened to me before in my life till you, you prayed for me. And they were all excited about prayer. This church was birthed off of prayer. I was meeting with a bunch of men. We didn't have any place to go. The church was locked. So we went to a karate center, and we start praying. First, we went house to house, and we'd start praying in the power of God. Prophecies would show up. We'd go to church, and we prophesied the message already. We heard it in prophecy, the message. Well, one day, it was, just, it was me and just brother, brother Joey Hall, my associate pastor, praying. Then we heard a knock at the door, and Brother Jimmy Bono showed up. Said, hey, man, I want in, man. I want in. What y'all doing, man? I want in. So he started praying. Then other brothers start showing up. Brother Johnny Treadaway, great man of God, was, was a Baptist and became Baptist when he got around us. Oh, yeah. He has more visions than anybody I know. He'll lay hands on you. He's a very humble man. He won't say this, but I'll say it about him. He's a seer, and he has more visions than anybody that I know. I mean, it's just an amazing man of God. And the power of God just began flowing. Matter of fact, the karate school we were praying at, they actually enlarged. I mean, God blessed that karate school. He moved to, he bought part of another building, another 10 feet. I mean, on a Sunday morning, we had 20 guys there praying. And the power of God would hit that place, man. It was amazing. And, and, and the Spirit of God was moving. People wanted to come pray. And God told me, God spoke to me, and he said, son, we're going to move this into the church. And then the pastor called me. The pastor's son called me and said, uh, they want to move it to the church. Because they saw it. That's the way it needs to be. Oh, what you got, we want. What you got, we want. So we start praying at church. And this was every, every morning, every Sunday morning especially. And man, the glory of God would manifest. And I'm telling you, we would prophesy the message before the message ever got there. And sometimes I would preach. I never opened the Bible. The Holy Ghost would come upon me. Sometimes he didn't give me a message. I'd say, God, you didn't give me a message. What am I going to tell the people? And all of a sudden, I'd start preaching and the Holy Ghost would just flow. Prophetic ministry. See, it's your privilege as a believer to come into the presence of Almighty God. It's your privilege to pray. And if, if you think prayer is some dry and dusty thing, listen, I've been there. I understand. I, as a new believer, I was trying to pray. And I'd go in my closet to pray. And the only thing I would hear after a while was the sound of me snoring because I would fall asleep. I had, it was so bad. I had, a, I had a, a, a clock that would, you turn the clock. And, you know, like one bit of timers, they go ding, 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 when an hour would go up. I'd try to pray an hour. Didn't work. So I said, I know what I'm going to do. I start walking every night and praying every single night. I'd go out praying and walking. And, and, and we'll talk about this later in this message, the gift of tongues that God had given me. I'd pray in the Holy Ghost. Didn't seem like anything was happening. Didn't seem like much was going on. I, I, I had cassette tapes, and I would listen to the Bible on cassette tapes. You've got to get serious about the things of God. How bad do you want your miracle? How bad do you want God to touch your life? How bad do you want to enter into the things of the Spirit? You have a part to play. I put that cassette uh, headset on, and I would start walking and praying. And I, I'd walk a mile. Well, you can't fall asleep. You've got to walk home. So, hey, that worked. I'd walk every night. And I remember uh, other brothers start coming with me, walking every night with me and praying. And God began to do amazing things. All of a sudden, the spiritual realm became real to me. One night I was walking, and about four or five feet behind me, there was an angel standing behind me, and I recognized it. And I was like, oh, God's got an angel right there. I knew exactly where he was at. And I was like, wow, I'm becoming sensitive to the things of the Spirit. Sometimes we're not sensitive about the things of the Spirit. And the more you pray, the more sensitive to God you'll be. And the more, the more we seek God, you'll begin to see and understand things. As a believer, you're called to, to be a dichotomy. You walk in the natural, but you also walk in the supernatural. One night, we were going to Angola uh, the next day, Saturday morning, to minister on death row and in main prison. And we went walking in the levee in St. Bernard Parish. And something in the, inside of me kept saying, turn around, go back, turn around, go back. And, 
And, but, but I did, not I kept going. And it was a bunch of guys on four-wheelers drinking alcohol and, and you know, just, just, I guess, drunk out of their mind. And one of the guys with me told him something. He said, hey, he said, uh, you almost ran us off the, the levee. And they all stopped their engines. Boom. So, you know, when you, you, you're doing numbers and math, six to eight and three of us. It's time to pray, guys. <laughs> time to pray. So I said, okay, God, what do you want me to do? And so I walked up to him, and, you know, you think in Rumble City, and I remember I did, I did just like this, glory to God, hallelujah, said, my name is Brother Joey, I'm going to Angola to preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, and I began shaking all their hands, said, Jesus loves you, he has a plan for your life, and I'm telling you, no exaggeration, the guy goes, Jesus, Angola, boom, bling, to God, to God. So we go praying, oh, man, I'm a glutton for punishment, so I go pray the next day, same thing. Walked on the same levee, came down the same levee, but now there's two cars parked next to each other. There's an elderly gentleman cursing out a younger person in the car next to him. So I'm praying in the Holy Ghost. I'm just walking, praying in the Spirit. Now, if you ever heard somebody praying in the Spirit, stick around. You'll hear it. I'm praying. I'm praying in the Holy Ghost. And the man starts cursing me out. And he says, you're a blankety, blankety, blankety. Is that right? I said, no, sir, that's not right. And he kicked the car door open, and he began marching over to me. Why me? They're all looking at me, it seems. I guess I'm the ringleader. So I was standing there, and I'm not exaggerating this at all. He stood there, and he got in my face, and he does this. Now, I've been praying for over an hour, and I made a decision. We had two other guys there. I could have took that guy out. But I said, you know what? I've been praying for an hour. If he hits me, I'm going to preach to him. I did just put my hands behind my back, just like this. And this is what I saw. No exaggeration. And I'm like, oh. And wait, any second. I'm watching a fist swing by my head. The whole time. I mean, it's just, he's swinging. This guy's drunk. He's not hitting me. And he's swinging at me. It's going to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right. Then he just stops and he looks startled. I'm startled too. I had my cassette player. The only thing, he, he just barely bumped my cassette player. And so I didn't know what to say. I said, man, you're going to hell. You need to get saved. I preached to him. So, man, I'm like shook up. I'm like, man, this is crazy. I'm meeting all these people and, and crazy stuff's happening. The devil was trying to send him to shut me down from praying. He didn't want me praying, obviously. So I remember going home and I went before God. I said, Heavenly Father, what's going on, man? People trying to attack me where I go. I said, thank you for delivering me. Glory to God, I appreciate that. The next day I was uh, going to Wendy's to eat and I always took my Bible because I was working for a company. I wasn't a businessman like I am now. And I always took my Bible at lunch. I had a lunch break. Take your Bible into Wendy's. Take your Bible into McDonald's. People look at you like, oh, he's got a Bible. He's got a Bible. <laughs> they look at you funny when you hold a Bible in a Wendy's or a McDonald's. So I opened my Bible up in Wendy's, and I saw a white Cadillac in the, par in the parking lot. And on this white Cadillac was scriptures all over this thing, man. Now, I had a red truck. And I had scriptures all over my truck box. You could say right behind me. As a matter of fact, somebody did. Crossing over the Greater New Orleans Bridge, somebody screamed at me, I did it! I did it! I said, what? She said, what's on your truck? Oh, God saved. Believe in the Lord. Thou shalt be saved. James, uh, uh, John 1, 12, John 3, 16. Well, anyway, here I am in Wendy's. and uh, it, it was a brother that was preaching in the project of New Orleans. His name was Brother Z. I never knew his name. To the, he went home to be with the Lord. Never knew him, but Brother Z was his name. He says, young man. I want you to look into the book of Timothy. So the man of God's telling me, look, yes, sir, I'll look with y'all. I look in Timothy, he gave me a scripture. And he said, now, young man, I want you to turn to the book of Acts. And one of the scriptures blew me away. It said this, not a hair of your head will be touched. That was a scripture. So, man, I'm stirred up in the Holy Ghost now. So I start prophesying on him right there in Wendy's. And the Lord thy God would say, so wait a minute, you prophesied in Wendy's? Close your eyes, nobody can see you. That's the way it works. You just close your eyes and prophesy. The Lord would say to you, and people are like, you can see, like, oh, yeah, give them some room, man. Give, give them room. <laughs> so Brother Z and I had a wonderful time of fellowship in the Lord. It was, it, was, it was good. But not a hair on my head was touched. But the enemy was trying to shut down the prayer. Because prayer changes things. Prayer does things. The greatest thing it did was in me. God making me sensitive to the things of the Spirit. I had never really prophesied too much before, but I remember walking along that night and prophesying to myself. And the Lord God would say, and I began to prophesy literally as I was walking along that night. So it'll build you up. You'll be sensitive to the things of God. It's the greatest adventure you'll ever go on, the adventure of prayer. 
And when you see God answering your prayers, as a matter of fact, I would pray for people, and I'd say, God, send a laborer to them. Send somebody to preach to them. It wasn't but a few days I'd be standing in front of that person, and the anointing of God would hit me. Just like I was preaching at church, I had people say, you should be a preacher. <laughs> the anointing would hit me for them, and I'd say, this anointing's for you. And sometimes I come across people and the anointing comes upon me and I begin to preach to them. I mean, you know, just preaching like I'm preaching a message. And then I'll ask them, who in your family is saved? Is your mama saved? Is your grandma saved? Who is saved? Oh, my mama, she's always praying for me. I said, that's why I'm here today. God is answering your mama's prayers. And he sent me as a laborer with the word of the Lord for you to get your life right, to get saved. Because God has a call. God has an election for you. So you keep praying and God's going to send somebody to him. I was reminded this week, one day I was riding in my vehicle, and the Lord said, head for Metairie. I said, okay, where are we going? He said, Wendy's. No problem. I like Wendy's. Wendy's is cool. We go to Wendy's. <laughs> so I went to Wendy's, and sure enough, there was somebody I was supposed to speak to there. So what I'm telling you is we just need to be God's feet, God's hand, God's voice here. Be obedient, and as we're praying, we're going to be sensitive to God to speak what God wants us to speak at the right time to the right person in the right place. The Bible says, with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding on behalf of all saints, God's consecrated people. Now, the first one we're going to look at, there's no way I'm going to get to all of them today. I'm just going to, this is just an introduction, because we're going to go in depth in every single one of these ways of prayer. Is the prayer of consecration. The prayer of consecration, dedication, and submission is where we come to God, and we say, God, whatever your will is for me. Now, it's real easy when what we want is what God wants, but it's not real easy when God wants us to do something that we don't want to do. Submission is never really submission until you come to a place where you don't really want to do something and God's asking you to do it. That's what submission is, when you're submitting to his will. As a matter of fact, the Bible says when Jesus was having a Passover with his disciples, he said, you're going to go to a place where, you, where two ways meet and you're going to find a donkey tied there. So it's a place where two ways meet. You're going to come to a place as a believer where two ways meet. Where your way and God's way. Your way makes sense. God's way doesn't make sense. You need to take God's way because what was at the place where two ways meet was a donkey. A stubborn donkey. And you're going to find out how much of a mule head you are when your ways and God's ways are going to intersect. I'm here to tell you, you take God's way. Don't go your way. Go God's way because it's always the right way. It may not make sense, but listen, you go God's way and it'll, it'll work out because God already knows. He's gone before you. Now, Matthew 26 and 37, it says he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. That would be James and John, which, by the way, they were called sons of thunder. And if you look it up, they were called sons of commotion. In other words, that daddy was somebody that was a commotion person causing trouble, and they probably had that nature too. You find in the Gospels, when someone didn't receive them, they said, shall we call down fire on them? Let's just kill them, God. <laughs> yeah, the apostle of love, kill them, God, call down fire. So he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Now here's an amazing thing. Where's the rest of the disciples? Why didn't he take them? It was always Peter, James, and John that were with him. They seem to draw closer to the Lord than the others. And as a believer, listen, you can, you can get as close to you want to get as God, but there are many believers that don't draw nigh to God. They're just content with a, a fire ticket, so to speak. Well, I'm not going to hell. Praise God for that. And I'll just live out here in the outskirts. God wants you to get close to him. You can be a Peter, James, and John if you want to be a Peter, James, and John. You don't have to be a disciple on the outskirts. You can get in close to God as close as you want. But Jesus here took Peter, James, and John, which, by the way, you need some close prayer partners in your life because there's going to be times in your life you need somebody that's going to pray with you, somebody that's going to be there for you. So here's Peter, James, and John. And he says to them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Guys, I am so hurting that I'm just going to die. I don't know if you've ever been there. I don't know if you've ever been so down, so hurt that you just want, you feel like you're going to die. Jesus was there. I hear people teach all the time, well, you don't have faith if you act that way. Don't tell me Jesus went through that. He was about to go through the greatest trial of his life. Some people say, was it the whipping that he was going to go through, the torture? Yeah, I'm sure that's part of it. But what was going to happen on the cross was the first time in eternity Jesus was going to be separated from his father. And he said it on the cross. He said it in the, 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 the Aramaic tongue, the Greek tongue, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had to turn his back on him because he became sin. I believe that's what he was dreading. He was dreading it. He says, guys, you've got to pray with me. Tarry ye here. Watch with me. Now, if you read the narrative, you're going to find out. He said, could you not tarry one hour with me? Because they all fell asleep. 
Here he is expressing his soul, expressing his heart, and they fell asleep. I mean, how would you feel? I feel like dying, guys. My guts are ripped out. Jess, please pray with me. And you, you're waiting to hear him over there saying, Lord, help him strengthen him. And this is what you hear. <laughs> yeah. People all the time say, pray for me, Pastor Joe. Lift me up in prayer. And I'll say, bow your head. Let's pray now. Because sometimes I might forget. I, I do my best because I'm human. Let's pray right now. Let's get the job done right now. Let's agree in prayer right now. Let's do this thing. But he said something amazing. Could you not tarry one hour? Something supernatural happens when you pray one hour. The Bible says the disciples would go into the house of the Lord at the hour of prayer. If you'll learn to pray one hour, something supernatural happens after one hour of prayer. I'm telling you, God's presence, God's glory, the longer you linger in prayer, the greater things that'll happen. I've been in prayer sometimes so long, I didn't even recognize how long it was. The presence of God saturated me. I said, it must be 20 minutes. Got to be 20 minutes. And his hours have gone by. But without the Spirit moving, you'll be there 10 minutes, seeming like it's an hour. But when you come into the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, hours go by and it doesn't matter. And you'll marinate in the presence of God. You know, if, if right now I walked in, you walk into a place that was filled with smoke, that smoke will get in your clothes. It'll get all over you. And so you'll go into another place and say, you smell like smoke. I can tell where you've been. When you've been in the presence of God, his anointing will saturate your very clothes, saturate your being, and you'll have a fragrance about you. And people will say, I can tell where you've been. There's a sweetness about you. There's something different about you. When you've been in the presence of God and you get into prayer, Here's the problem. The devil wants to keep you out saying, you're not worthy. You're not this. You've done this sin. You've done that. You say, Heavenly Father, wash me in the blood. You can enter boldly to the throne of grace because the blood of the Lamb says you are worthy. The blood of the Lamb says you are justified. The blood of the Lamb says you are welcome. The blood of the Lamb has spoken over you. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. Don't listen to the devil. You can enter into prayer and intercede and spend time with him. We'll get into the prayer fellowship later on. So here he is. He went a little farther and fell on his face. Even though he called him the prayer, there's sometimes you just got to get away by yourself with God. You need God. You got to hear from God. You got to get a word from God. I, I'm glad every young person that's going off to college, you get an education, I say go do it. But you need to learn how to pray because your education is not going to help you. When a doctor says you've got a terminal illness, when you can't pay your bills, when your kid's on drugs, when life throws things at you, you better know how to get a hold of God. And you don't need a bunch of religion. You need a real Jesus. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. Well, you can grab a hold of God. When somebody's trying to sue you and things happen in life, you don't know what's going on. You better get a hold of him and know how. Some of us get a prayer life just when we're in trouble. Prayer life should be all the time, about everything. It should be a fellowship with God. So when trouble comes, you're already at the feet of Jesus. Oh, my goodness. He fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father. Now, the prayer of consecration will have an if in it. Prayers of faith do not. Like, for instance, if you come to the altar, I'm trying to teach you how this works. If you come to the altar and, and you say, I said, what do you need? Well, I want to pray for a healing right now. I said, okay, I'm going to pray. If you say, if the Lord will do it, it's not going to work. Because where the revealed will of God is known, we don't pray with the if. When Jesus, when a leper came to Jesus, he said, Lord, if you would heal me, you know, heal me. And he said, I will. It is the will of God to heal you and restore you and make you whole. That's what the Bible teaches. But the prayer of consecration is a prayer where you don't know what God wants. You may not know where he wants you to go. You say, Lord, if it be possible. And this is Jesus that all things are possible. It says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. This thing I have to drink, this thing I have to go through. But he says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as I will. Now, the Bible says he sweat great drops of blood. Physicians would tell us in moments of deep stress that that could happen, that you could, you could literally sweat great drops of blood. We know it happened because the Bible says it happened. So he was sweating it. I've heard people say, don't sweat it. Jesus sweat it. Jesus sweat it in prayer. And his disciples were sleeping, weren't sweating it with him. So don't get mad at anybody if they fall asleep. Don't pray for you. There's sometimes you just got to get along with God. Get a hold of him. You and him are a majority. Because he never sleeps. He never slumbers. You're not going to say, you're not going to sweat it out and say, oh God, oh God, my husband left me. My wife left me. My finances aren't working out. And in the throne room, you're not going to hear, wake up, 
Jesus, wake up. 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 Wake He's not sleeping and slumbering at the throne. He's always there. He's there. He doesn't sleep. He's, he's there waiting for you to cry out to him. People will fall out and, and fall asleep, but he is always listening. His line is always open. I like to say his phone number is 5015. Call upon me. You can call upon him at any time, day or night. He's always there, always ready to listen. The devil is the one that's trying to keep you out. The devil is the one lying to you. Man, just put him under your feet where he belongs. Not as I will, but as thou wilt. This is the prayer of consecration, dedication, and submission to God. Will you submit your way unto the Lord? I like this little sign. It says, do not ask God to guide your footsteps if you're not willing to move your feet. Oh, Lord, I go wherever you want to go. Go to Sister Jones' house and tell her that you love her. Oh, Lord, any place you want me to go, any place but Sister Jones' house. Go tell her what you, look, you had a little nasty attitude. Go tell her how ugly you've been to her and, and tell her you love her. Oh, no, that's not God. Uh-uh. No, consecration says I'm going to do it. I've had God have, have me call people before telling me you're sorry. I call them up and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't act right. I, I needed a case of act right. And God got the case of act right on me. We all go through that need a case of act right. You got flesh. I saw a movie the other day called The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. Well, the good is God. The bad is the devil. And it is the other ugly. It's called the flesh. And in your flesh, you can be so ugly. You can be in church praising God. I love you, Lord. I worship you. Somebody cut you off in the car, and you sound like a sailor. What? Oh, my goodness. All kind of garbage coming out. Excuse my French. That's not French. That's called cursing. I know French. Paul du Francais, you didn't say that. You didn't even bless them in French, matter of fact. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. That's what happens. Well, you know, you've got to give your tongue to God through prayer, especially praying in tongues, because the Bible says in James, the most unruly member of your body is the tongue. And if you can yield this unruly member to God, the rest of you will follow. Your hands and heart and feet and mind will follow. You've got to yield this first, your tongue to God in prayer. So we're going to look at the prayer of faith number two. I've got a couple minutes. I'm just going to stop on this one, because I've got a lot to share with you guys. Prayer of faith. So the prayer of faith, the Bible says in James 5 and 15, shall save the sick. So wait, if there's a prayer of faith, there could be a prayer of unbelief. Sometimes people come in hope and not faith at all. God, you believe God's going to heal you? Well, I hope so. Hope is the blueprint of faith. You're in hope and I'm in faith. It's not going to work. If you're in hope and I'm in faith, it's not going to work. You've got to come in faith, believing you're going to receive. Brother Curtis right here the other day was by my house. And he came up to me, can I, I'm saying, he goes, boo-boo, I want the Holy Ghost. I said, okay. So I preached the word to him. I preached the, through the gospels all about the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit. So after I preached to him, I said, you believe you're going to receive? He said, yep, I'm ready to receive. Laid hands on him and he got the Holy Ghost right there in my kitchen. Glory to God. You got to believe you're going to receive. That's the prayer of faith. Faith puts a demand on the ability of God. God wants me to tell you this. Years ago, I wasn't pastoring and there's gifts that God has deposited in all of our lives. And one of the gifts he's given me is prophecy. Another gifts and Man, this brother would uh, knock on my door. I'm eating spaghetti, right? I got spaghetti all over. Open the door. I said, what's up, man? He said, brother Joey, I need a word from God, man. I need a word from God. I got sp I'm eating spaghetti, dude. I'm meatballs. It's the only word I got. Okay. I put my hand on him. And as soon as I put my hand on him, the Lord, and the Lord that God would say unto you. And I saw prophesying. And I'm like, what in the world? I'm eating spaghetti now. I'm prophesying. I... I or I'd be watching TV. Open the door. Hey, man, I need a word from God. I'm like, I, you know, I was, I was watching TV. Okay. The Lord that God would say, I'm like, what in the world? I'm prophesying again. Where is this coming from? This would go on over and over again. And I was amazed how the word of the Lord kept coming forth when I'm doing things that wasn't in prayer. I was just, you know, at home doing normal things. And God showed me faith puts a demand on the ability of God. His faith was putting a demand on the ability resident in, me, resident in me through the Holy Ghost and drawing it out. Yeah, faith puts a demand on the ability of God. It was Oral Roberts who had prayed for hundreds of people, maybe thousands. He was exhausted. He said, I'm done. I got to rest. I can't pray anymore. And a woman stopped in the parking lot and said, Brother Roberts, you're going to pray on me and I'm going to get my healing. He said, woman, I'm not going to pray on you. I am tired. I am going. He said, no. You're, she said, no, you're not passing me. So you pray on me. Oh, man. All right. 
Lord, heal her in Jesus' name. She was instantly healed. And God said, that's on her faith, not yours. Her credit, not yours. Her faith put a demand on the ability of God. So what can you believe God for? The prayer of faith. When you come to this altar and the prayer team's here. What are you coming believing for? Put a demand on the ability of God. Believe God for your miracle. Believe God for your healing. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't come from a book report. It doesn't come from a nice little sermonette where you might uh, please your flesh. It comes from the immutable word of God that is preached to you. You receive it in your heart. Faith will rise up and you'll step out and you'll walk the water like Peter and say, I got my miracle. I have got my healing. I have got my deliverance. Oh yeah, faith. It comes from the preaching of the word. The foolishness of preaching. But how many don't come to church to hear it? Don't even read their Bible. And when all hell breaks loose, pray Pastor Joe, you're trying to get faith now. Man, you gotta stay built up in faith. When you come in the prayer team, man, whatever you're believing for, release your faith with them. Say, I believe I receive when I pray and you'll get it. Well, what if I don't see anything? That's what faith is. It's the title deed, the evidence of things hoped for. So I preach the gospel to you today. And you say, I hope that's for me. Well, God's no respect to a person. It is for you. He doesn't care where you've been, what you look like. If you have faith, God will move in your life. I found God would jump over three and four or five people to get to the one that's believing him. And I'll prove something to you really quick. Jesus, we all know he's the son of God. We all know he's God in the flesh. But in his own hometown of Nazareth, the Bible says, and I find this amazing, he could do no mighty work. He could do no mighty work. Jesus marveled. It's one of the times in the Bible he marveled. He prayed for somebody and nothing happened. And he marveled. They were so familiar with him. Well, I know where you were raised. You, you know, whatever it may be. I don't like your pedigree, whatever it may be. Their unbelief paralyzed the power of God. There was no demand put upon the ability of God resonant in him, which was unlimited ability. He is and was the body of Christ. We're his body in the earth, but he had the spirit without measure. And they couldn't receive anything from a man, from the God-man who had the spirit without measure. Your unbelief will stop up the things of God. The second time he marveled was a Roman soldier. He said, I'm not worthy to come under your roof. My servant's sick at home. Jesus said, I'll come, I'll come. He said, no, no, I'm not worthy. He said, just speak the word. I'm a man of authority. Speak the word, it's done. He said, I haven't seen faith like this. No, not in Israel. Wow, he said, go ahead, it's done. It's done. Your faith puts a demand on the ability of God. What can you believe God for? I always thought Jesus walked around healing the sick like this. Healed, healed. Yep, you're over there behind a rock. You're healed, you're healed, you're healed. No, no. Two blind men came to Jesus. They're blind. And they said, Lord, he said, what do you want me to do for you? I was looking at it like, what do you want me to do for you? What if they said, we have an ingrown toenail, Lord. <laughs> Be healed of your ingrown Can you believe that I'm able to heal this ingrown toenail? Yes. They had walked away blind. They said, Lord, that we might receive our sight. And then he said an am amazing thing. Believe you that I'm able to do this. Do you have faith to believe I'm able to do this? And, and they said, yes, Lord. He said, Be it done unto you according to your faith. God wants me to tell you one more really quick about faith. The Bible says there was a woman with the issue of blood. 12 years she had gone to all the physicians. She could not be made well. The physicians were doing what they could do. And we know even in our day they can do what they can do. Thank God for every one of them. But she got desperate. Because in that day, if you were a woman with the issue of blood, you had to have a bell with you and you had to walk in the crowd and say, unclean, unclean, unclean. Don't touch that woman. She's got an issue of blood. That woman kept saying to herself, if I touch the hem of his garment, if, if I touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to break the rules. I'm going to move through the crowd. I'm, I'm not going to go with the, the rules where they said I got to ring a bell. I'm not going to make myself known, but I'm just going to sneak up and I'm going to touch his hem of his garment. Because if I touch that, I've heard about this man. I've heard about him, that miracles flow through him. If I touch him, I'll be made whole. The same as today. If you just could believe, if I just touch him, a point of contact of faith. If I just touch him, the touch of his spirit. If the touch of his spirit will touch me, I'll be made whole. She kept saying it to herself. See, you got to say it to yourself over and over again. If I come to that altar and prayers or hands are laid, I believe I'm going to receive it. Then the second thing that happened, she moved through the crowd. She reached out and touched Jesus. And the Bible says that virtue left Jesus. 
And he said, who touched me? Now I've experienced this before where I felt the power of God flow through my hands and I felt the virtue leave me. I felt it physically. Jesus said, virtue has left me. And, and Peter said, everybody's touching you, Lord. What do you mean? He said, no, no, no. Somebody touched me. It's called the touch of faith. And he turned around and there was the woman. And now the woman told everything that had happened. She told the whole story. And then she, he said, go and behold. So what she did was four things. She said it. She acted upon what she was saying. She did it. And she received it. The third thing, then she testified to it. These principles are working in your life with the prayer of faith. What you're saying is going to tell me where your face at. If you only believe. Only believe. That's all you got to do. You don't have any problems at all. All you need is faith in God. All you need is faith in God today. Now would you bow your head with me right now? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. If you're not saved, you don't know Jesus, the Bible says you must confess, and that means you say it with your mouth. Believe that Jesus is Lord. Believe that he died on the cross. Believe that he was buried. Believe that he rose again the third day. And you speak it out of your mouth. Say it with me boldly. Jesus, I call on your name. I believe you died for me. I believe you were buried. I believe you were raised again. And with my mouth, I confess you as the Lord of my life. And I thank you that according to your word, I am saved in Jesus' name. It's that simple. I want to pray this blessing on you. I'm going to let you go. Just raise your hands with me. Thank you, Lord. There's, there's people that God's called to preach the gospel here today. God's called you to preach the gospel. God's called you to preach the gospel. I don't know who you are. God's called you to preach the gospel. He's called you to the ministry. I don't know who you are. But I, I'm here to tell you that he'll speak to your heart about the ministry. He's called you. But you have to study to show yourself approved. You've got to seek it out. You've got to seek it out. And God's going to do great things in your life. God wants you to know it's one step at a time. You start studying. You start praying. He's not going to reveal it all to you at one time. It'll happen. It'll happen as you seek God in prayer. So you have a part to play. I need to tell you this. When you get to heaven, if you say, God, why didn't I fulfill my destiny? Why didn't I fulfill my call? And God's going to say, I told you through my prophet that you have to pray and seek my face so you can understand what I want you to do. If you don't pray, you'll keep meandering through life and you'll miss out on what God wants you to do. So if you're serious, God's basically saying the ball's in your court. You come after me, you seek me, and I'll reveal it to you. That's what he's saying to you today. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And he says, when you do that, don't worry about what to say. He says, I'm going to give you the words to say. I'll give you the anointing. It's not you anyway. God says, it's me. All you need to do is yield to me. And you need to come after me and pray. And I'll put the rest. I'll do the rest. Come after me and find out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Lord, I bless your people today in the name of Jesus. I decree your favor upon them. Father, I break every negative word ever spoken over their life in the name of Jesus. I bind every demon and principality and power and ruler and spiritual wickedness that would come against them. I break the chains in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus over them. Satan, you may not touch them. You may not touch their houses. You may not touch their finances. You may not touch their children. In Jesus' name, ministering spirits, angels of the Lord, go forth and be dispatched on the behalf of the people of God. Father, cause the hedge to rise higher. Psalm 91 over your people, Lord God. Let a thousand fall at their side and ten thousand at their right hand. And Father, I pray restoration upon them. Restore their heart towards you. Restore their mind, Lord God. Restore their peace, Lord God. The shalom of God, the wholeness of God in their life. Restore, 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 God, in Jesus' name. Oh, Father, I ask it. Restore their prayer life. Restore their time in the Word with you. Restore their walk with you. Restore their bodies, Lord God, that have been broken. Mend them and make them whole. Father, we pray this and bless your people. Make your face to shine upon them. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Let your favor be in their house. We bless them in the name of Jesus. And Father God, we give you all the praise and all the glory. All the glory is yours, Heavenly Father. Blessed Holy Spirit, all the glory is yours, Lord. We lift you up, O oh God, and we bless you in this place, O oh Lord. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done and are going to do in the blessed, majestic name 
of Jesus. Amen.